Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and we're here again at this dear old paradise for a wander around paradise. And it's a positive one. What a beautiful morning we've got here in Glasgow. And we're here to talk also about our progression in the Scottish Cup at the weekend. Celtic were drawn, of course, against St Mirren and we took a trip to Paisley with the last fixture fresh in the mind where we went there and beat them 3 nothing. Would it be the same? Uh, would we play the similar sides that we uh, put out against uh, Hibs at Easter Road or would we change the shape? We spoke about all these things on a Celtic state of mind leading up to the game. And there was a few surprises, I think, when you looked at that starting lineup. Brendan Rodgers did indeed change the shape. And I think that the most exciting part about that was looking at Kyogo and the fact that he was playing a more deeper role. I was really interested to watch that and see how he performed because I think that Kyogo's form has been patchy this season and a big part of that is that the pace in which we play doesn't suit the pace of the game that he actually prefers and I think we had the discussion last week Liam Carrigan made a brilliant point that when Kyogo plays in a team that doesn't have the high tempo and the high press he doesn't play as well and he used the Japan national side as an example of that we're always surprised when he doesn't get selected and of course he missed the Asian Cup just recently but Liam said it's all down to the style of play and the speed of play not suiting Kyogo. So it was interesting to see that he was going to be playing a slightly different role. Celtic have been ravished by injury this season. Um, I mean, let's not forget that. And yesterday, when you look at that starting lineup, we were missing um, quite a few defenders in Alistair Johnston, Greg Taylor, Cameron Carter Vickers, and in the midfield, we're still missing Rio Hatate. So a bit of a patchwork defence. How would they fare against the St. Mirren side? who actually came out and tried to play us. I mean, they didn't just sit in 10 men behind the ball. They made a game of it. For anyone watching it from a neutral perspective, it would have been a really enjoyable game. Some really good chances for St Mirren. We'll come back to that because I felt that we resolutely defended um, the pressure that they put us under. And Joe Hart had a very, very good game. We're going to be concentrating on the goals um, as well because I think the opening goal from Kyogo was a thing of beauty. We were used to seeing that under Ange Postecoglou, weren't we? The flowing move, brilliant pass from Callum McGregor, inch perfect. Lewis Palmer timed his through ball into Kyogo uh, to perfection as well. And what about that run from a deeper kind of area of the pitch from Kyogo? First time shot, he was delighted. Matt O'Reilly was delighted if you watch him and Celtic were a goal up. So we're a goal up at half time and Celtic were playing a more fluid style of football. I think Callum McGregor, even though we had one man less in the midfield. Seemed to have more space, he controlled the game, he orchestrated the pace of the game, and as I say, that pass through to Palmer. Am I allowed to say it was McStay-esque? A lot of people in the comments will say, don't you dare compare him to McStay. What a pass it was. It was phenomenal. We Kyogo looked really happy um, when he scored. It almost lifted the mood. It really did, and in the second half, I, as I say, credit to St Mirren. Um, we gave away possession straight away. They, they put us under a wee bit of pressure. But we did score the second goal, and I think that there's been a lot made of the wingers this season. Um, I would like to make a point, a pointing out that uh, Lewis Palmer was involved in both goals. The first one was a direct assist. The second one, I think you would class it as a secondary assist because he's played the ball into Matt O'Reilly, who hit the bar, and there was an instinctive finish by Dyson Maeda. Um, and again, you know, I know that Maeda's final ball isn't always the best. There was a few examples of that yesterday, but overall. What he brings to the, 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 the team and to the party with his work rate and his defensive qualities and the fact that he really plays high up the park, he closes down the St Mirren defenders, constantly putting them under pressure, creating space for other people. He would be in my start 11 every single week. I think Maeda, you know, for any faults that he's got, he makes up for it. And what about the non-celebration as well? I mean, it was even, it was even worse than Maravchik when he scored against Rangers that time. He looks like a sniper, doesn't he? Yeah, he's so cool. Dies and made, and it was great to get the second goal. But it was an easy street after that, was it? Because I think that, as I said, St Mirren came out, some really, really good chances. And I think a lot of credit goes to the defence. And in particular, Joe Hart. Now, Joe Hart is a player um, who has come under a bit of pressure and a bit of criticism this season. We were expecting a new goalkeeper in in the January transfer window. He, at, at points this season, has been a, win a match winner for us. I'm thinking a couple of big saves against Rangers in the 2-1 game. The St Johnson game 3-1 at McDermott Park and against, again yesterday. Now, if this is his last season, I think we'll look back on Joe Hart's time at Celtic. The three seasons he spent with us very, very fondly indeed.
So a convincing win and a good performance for Celtic against St Mirren into the next round. And we will be facing Livingston here at Celtic Park. It's a fixture you would look at and I know that anything can happen in the cup. But on that form that Celtic have shown, and let's be honest, nine games unbeaten, uh, I think that uh, we'll be able to go through to the next round against Livingston Rangers, of course, playing Hibs at Easter Road in one of the other quarter-finals as well. One of the omissions yesterday that was not due to injury, but we had a lot of people uh, wondering what the issue was, was Leela Bada uh, missing from the Celtic squad. And, you know, sometimes you wonder if a player's picked up a wee strain or a knock at training in the lead-up to these games, because nothing had been mentioned. But after the game, Brendan Rodgers confirmed that it was down to his frame of mind. He's pulled him away from the squad, um, and he said that he noticed it, obviously, in the game against Hibs. Anybody who watched that game just knew by looking at Leela Bada that his, his mind wasn't on it. There was a moment, I, I mentioned it after the game, where he's basically just kicked the ball out the park. It wasn't in the direction of any player. It was as if he wasn't focused on the game. So Brennan Rodgers obviously has taken him out of the uh, firing line and out of the limelight. And uh, the focus will now be on Leela Bada and making sure that, that he as an individual is okay. But where does it leave Celtic in the, the current situation? We've got 13 league games. We've got potentially another three games in the Scottish Cup. And we need everybody to be focused um, and as, as part of a team and bonding and all these kind of things. And I think that there's a massive question mark now over Leela Bader's future at Celtic Park. Um, I've said before, regardless of whatever the background is, if a player is unhappy, then it's not healthy to keep them at the club. We've seen it in the past. Our sympathies are with the situation that he finds himself in, because obviously here at Celtic Park, we have a, a huge part of the fan base who politically and from a humanitarian standpoint will always support Palestine. And then you've got Leela Bader getting a lot of pressure from um, his uh, home nation and from people within football over in Israel, uh, pressurising them perhaps to leave Celtic. So it's a unique position for a footballer to find himself in. And this is a unique football club. And I think that if he's unhappy, there are other markets open out there, aren't they? And if it results in him leaving the club, then it might be the best for all parties involved. We move on to our next fixture here at Celtic Park. And what has Axon been up to? A Celtic state of mind took a wee trip over to Belfast at the weekend. We were at the Glen Park Ballroom and Simon Donnelly and Jackie McNamara were on tremendous forum. We met up with Tommy Johnston as well, you know, uh, leading up to the event. So I got the opportunity to meet three guys who were part of Vim Janssen's side that stopped to 10. And of course, two of them were part of Martin O'Neill's side who won a treble here at Celtic as well. It was a tremendous uh, weekend, and I'll tell you the best part about it was meeting some of the people that tune into a Celtic State of Mind. The Ardoin boys, including Paddy Lavery, phenomenal to meet Paddy again. Um, and we, you know, we had Frankie Kane coming up as well. I know Frankie tunes in to the show. Uh, it was just brilliant from start to finish, and we will definitely be back. We love doing the live events and you know, bringing ex Celts to various parts of the country. And we have a few gigs with Paddy McCourt lined up. The tickets for those gigs, Inverness, Oban, Fort William are underneath this video and we're going to announce another couple of dates with Paddy in Glasgow and Grangemouth and Martin O'Neill is coming back to Glasgow with a Celtic state of mind as well. We are of course still raising funds for wee Jamie Tierney. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the condition he suffers from and his family needs 60 grand every single year to treat that condition um, and try and slow down the process of this muscular wasting disease. So please click on the link if you haven't done so already. Thanks for joining me again here for a wander around paradise and make sure that you join us tomorrow at 12.30 on a Celtic state of mind.